All right, here we go. I know it's cold outside. Hey, Sister Sap, how you doing? But uh, we are going to be faithful to Proverbs chapter 15. Hey, family, I see y'all coming in. I see y'all coming in. All righty. Happy MLK Day. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It is a great day. Happy MLK Day. Well, we are getting ready to dive into Proverbs chapter 15. Uh, can you believe it? We're halfway through. Uh, tomorrow we'll be on the other side of halfway through of uh, Proverbs 31. One proverb a day, um, doing some noonday nuggets. Hope that you and your family are enjoying them. Uh, Proverbs 15 is going to be a good chapter for us. Um, we're looking forward to it. And so, uh, but it is cold outside and um, we're going to uh, get after these, hopefully use these Proverbs to warm us up a little bit. So uh, praying for your safety, your family safety, uh, all those things. So feel free to uh, share and uh, allow other family and friends to join in. Uh, I'm going to pray for us in just a second, and we'll start reading Proverbs chapter 15. So, um, Jarvis Hodge, happy MLK Day. Yeah, Y'all make sure you share, amen? All right, let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together one more time, Lord, uh, in this unique circumstance to where we celebrate um, the birth of Martin Luther King and uh, this MLK Day. Lord, we pray that uh, as we gather together that as he said um, in one of his speeches, whatever you do, try to be the best at it. And um, whether you're a street sweeper, be the best at it. Whatever you do, be the best at it. And so God, help us through the wisdom of Proverbs, God, to make that transition to be wise and productive because you've called us to it. And Lord, we ask that you would be with each family represented, God, those that it will be shared with and will come across this. And uh, Lord, we just pray for a great time today in Proverbs 5. Be with us. And uh, give us some wisdom, give us some insights, give us some nuggets. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All righty, family. Uh, we are in Proverbs chapter 15. I'll start reading. We'll go 1 through 33, and then we'll come back and we'll dive into some nuggets. Amen. Proverbs 15, verse 1. It comes out powerful. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 15 comes out the box swinging. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable, but the mouth of fools spouts folly. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. A soothing tongue is a tree of life, but perversion in it crushes the spirit. A fool rejects his father's discipline, but he who regards reproof is sensible. Great wealth is in the house of the righteous, but trouble is the income of the wicked. The lips of the wise spread knowledge, but the heart of fools are not so. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he who, get, he who loves one, but he loves one who pursues righteousness. Grievous punishment is for him who forsakes the way. He who hates reproof will die. Sheol and Abaddon lie open before the Lord. How much more the hearts of men. A scoffer does not love uh, one who reproves him. He will not go to the wise. Verse 13, a joyful heart makes a cheerful face. But when the heart is sad, the spirit is broken. The mind of the intelligent seeks knowledge, but the mouth of fools feeds on folly. All the days of the afflicted are bad, but a cheerful heart has a continual feast. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil with it. Better is a dish of vegetables where love is than a fattened ox served with hatred. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but a slow, but the slow to anger calms the dispute. The way of the lazy is a hedge of thorns, but the path of the upright is a highway. A wise son makes his father glad, but a foolish man despises his mother. Folly is joy to him who lacks sense, but a man of understandings walks straight. 
Without consultation, plans are frustrated. But with many counselors, they succeed. A man has joy in an apt answer. And how delightful is a timely word. The path of life leads upward from uh, for the wise, that he may keep away from Sheol below. The Lord will tear down the house of the proud, but he will establish the boundary of the widow. Evil plans are an abomination to the Lord, but pleasant words are pure. He who profits illicitly troubles his own house, but he who hates bribes will live. The heart of the righteous ponders how to anger, but the mouth of the uh, how to answer. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. Bright eyes gladden the heart. Good news puts fat on the bones. He who he he, <laughs> I'm laughing at that. He whose ears listen to the life giving reproof will dwell among the wise. He who neglects discipline despises himself, but he who listens to reproof acquires understanding. The fear of the Lord is the instruction for wisdom and <laughs> before honor comes humility. All right, y'all, <laughs> that got me. Um, hold up real quick. <laughs> Where'd that verse go? All right, let me see. Man, that was funny. Okay, all right. Let's dive in, y'all. So we're, we're in Proverbs chapter 15, and we're just coming by to uh, try to share some, some uh, noonday nuggets with each other. And uh, as we've been traveling as a church and family and friends, uh, through the book of Proverbs, one Proverbs a day for 31 days. Uh, we're now in the section after Proverbs 1 through 9 are really speeches from the father talking to the son. And then 10 through the end are primarily the sayings of the father and or the results of decisions that people make, whether uh, family members, wives, uh, trying to become wise or either ending up foolish. And so we're diving in to Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15 verse 1 starts out like this. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A gentle answer stirs up wrath. So one of the things, one of the nuggets for us to think about relationally and in conversation with each other and or with anybody is that a gentle answer, a response to something that somebody has said, to, to, to have an answer, you must be responding to something that somebody said. But they say a gentle answer um, turns away wrath. What could turn into a large argument, a large dispute, is based on how one answers. Now, gentleness is a fruit of the spirit. That's something that ought to be characteristic of the believer. And so we need to answer each other in a gentle way. That when we think about an answer, we just don't pop off. It's easy to pop off. But he says, when we pop off, a harsh word stirs up anger. So instead of a gentle answer, really considering how do I respond to this statement? Even if the person was foolish towards you does not mean that their foolishness towards you uh, requires for you to turn around and act a fool yourself. And, and, and it's easy um, to see somebody say something and you say, OK, no, 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 no. I got something for you today. But but he says, listen, there are times to where a gentle answer turns away wrath that we didn't have to have an argument. We didn't have to have a fight over this issue. If I would have responded to your foolishness with faithfulness in my answer and gentleness in my answer and truthfulness in my answer, then it may not have gone further. But if I come back harsh, it just stirs up a big, gigantic commotion. So being, uh, here's the nugget, uh, thinking through how you respond to a person regardless of how they treated you. That, that, we're not talking about just allowing people to disrespect you, but you can respond to ignorance with intelligence. And intelligence has a way of shutting down ignorance. It's just how well you and I become skilled at that general answer. And so that's one thing that you think about relationally when it comes to being a wise person is how do I respond to ignorance? If you respond to ignorance with ignorance, it keeps pushing ignorance down the road. But sometimes when you respond to ignorance with intelligence, it can shut the whole conversation down. So uh, our goal is to have a general response. The tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable, but the mouth of fools spouts folly. Now, this is big because one of the things that we've consistently seen as we've been traveling through Proverbs for Noonday Nuggets is that God is all over this tongue. God is all over how we use our mouths and our tongues as it relates to wisdom and proving to be a wise person or a foolish person. So it says, the tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable, 
there are certain people that when they're speaking and when they're talking, the answers that they give are given in such a way in their communication that, that people want to hear it. People want to receive it. One of the gentlemen, one of the persons that I think about in my life who is a reflection of one and two is Pastor Bill Lawson from Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church. I watched him um, from 1992 to 1997 talk about very um, serious matters, serious critical issues in the community, but it was the way in which his approach said something that it was received when Pastor Lawson said it. Now, it might be a controversial issue. It may involve some injustices to where people had to look at themselves and respond on what they had done from an injustice perspective. But it was the way that Pastor Lawson put it that it was almost like, yeah, I did do wrong. He just had a way about himself of saying things, uh, and you never saw him waver high or low, always right there. It was that gentleness, it was that fruit of the spirit, it was that thoughtfulness in his answers and his responses to people. So the tongue of the wise makes knowledge acceptable. Now think about this, the tongue of the wise. That means that a wise person, when they're talking to a person who may be naive or who may be young or who may be foolish, they make knowledge acceptable. So now the tongue of the wise has the ability to influence those that are in different states and or conditions to bring them to the wise road. And so that's why it's important for us to get control of our tongues. Just like James chapter three talks about the tongue and the man who can master his tongue has perfected his life. Now, verse three, the eyes of the Lord are in every place watching the evil and the good. Uh, when he starts talking about the eyes of the Lord, he starts talking about the omniscient nature of God, an all knowing God who sees the good and the bad, and his eyes are in every place, and he's watching the evil and the good. God, as he watches the evil and the good, just doesn't watch the physical world, uh, just doesn't watch the external world, he watches the internal world. In other words, he can see people do good things um, on the outside, that's what it's perceived to be, but recognize on the inside the heart is wrong. Uh, his eyes are in every place watching the evil and the good. In other words, we don't get away with anything. Um, we can think that we got away with it from humans, uh, but God is watching and understanding why we do what we do. What is the motivation? What's the intention? Is that really good uh, that you're doing or is that good for your advantage? Are you plotting and scheming down the road or is this really heartfelt goodness coming from you? So God is always watching where we are as it relates to what we do. Verse four, a soothing tongue is a tree of life, but perversion in it is uh, crushes the spirit. If you think about uh, the, the post that I posted earlier today, just letting us know that we were doing a noonday nuggets, there's a tree on one side that's fruitful and there's a tree on the other side that's dying. And in Proverbs 15, four it says, a soothing tongue is a tree of life. Um, a soothing tongue, um, heals people, helps people, um, blesses people. A soothing tongue being a tree of life, it is a source of life-giving information. But perversion in it crushes the spirit. So that, that, that tree of life in that wise tongue, it builds others up. But one, when one has perversion, it tears people down. It crushes the spirit. It internally destroys, brings about destruction. So we gotta watch how our tongues are used. And so when we start talking about wisdom uh, over the last few days, I want you to think back each day how much God is pushing wisdom out through what we say and how we say it and how we manage our heart and our tongue and our conversations. So um, verse five, a fool rejects the father's discipline, but he who regards reproof is sensible. A fool rejects his father's discipline. Um, a foolish person does not listen to what uh, his father is saying. Now, there's an assumption in Proverbs that this is a wise father, that this is a father that's trying to help a son move from a naive state or an inexperienced state or a young state to a wise state. And even going as far as trying to reach a son that may be on the foolish path to get them on the right path. So he says, a fool rejects his father's instruction. When, when you think about your dad and how much he loves you, um, then when you reject your father's instruction, there's no one else 
who's going to care about you the way that your father does. Um, and th and that, that, that's what Solomon is trying to share with the people here. And, and he, he says, so you're a fool to reject what your dad is teaching you. And here's why you're a fool. Because your dad was designed by God to be the primary teacher. One of the problems in our society today is that many of us as fathers do not know what our primary role is. And our primary role is to be the primary instructor of our children, not our wives, not the women of society, but we as men. It is a divine assignment that God has given us. And as God gives us that divine assignment, we take that assignment seriously and we begin to instruct our sons. So if we're instructing our sons in the right way, down the right path, and our son isn't listening, then that means that your son's a fool. Um, and, and, and the reality is, is that's what God is saying, is that why in the world would you reject the teachings of a good father? And um, and so as as we look at that, the, the wisdom has to also be received, not just given. So when we know that there's a transaction of wisdom, it's when one is given wisdom in such a way to where it's received, and as a result, you see the progress of the next generation. Um. Uh, let's let's look down uh, to go, go down to verse seven. The lips of the wise spread knowledge, but the hearts of fools are not so. Wise people spread knowledge. Wise people are about the business of allowing knowledge to go out, that they want to make sure that people are aware of the things that God wants and the things that God desires. They want to make sure that people, if, if, if people are here because they lack the wisdom of God or the information about God, they want to make sure that they bring the food down here so that they can build the person up. So they spread knowledge. They send knowledge out. That's what a wise person does. A wise person does not keep wisdom in. They spread knowledge out to make sure that everybody has it. Um, but the hearts of fools are not so. Fools don't want to share anything. <laughs> fools aren't interested in saying anything to help anybody. Uh, fools focus on hurting people, destroying people, and being wicked. And so watch this verse 8, the next verse. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. So you notice how he's, he starts talking about the sacrifice of the wicked. Wicked people think that they can do religious things and make themselves right with God. Wicked people think that they can do religious things and make themselves right with God. And the Bible says the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. So back at this time, when the Jewish people were sacrificing, they thought that the sacrifice could get them back straight with God. And he says, when the wicked person is sacrificing, you may be sacrificing and engaging in religious activity, but religious activity does not change your position with me because I know who you really are. In other words, God is reading deep down into our hearts and souls and said, that is a religious act, but your heart is far from me. And so God is able through his wisdom to say, to discern, hey, you know, that's a false false, uh, false gift. That's a false uh, and fake effort towards me. It can look good on the outside, but it's not real towards me. But watch this. But the prayer of the upright is his delight. God loves to hear his people pray. The prayer of the upright is his delight. When God sees his people praying, he gets excited. He starts smiling. We went through a series called Q&A last year, Prayers God Answers. It was an amazing series. Many people grew from that series, Q&A, Prayers God Answers. But right here, think about this, is that prayer is not a burden. Prayer is a blessing. And prayer um, is when God hears his people pray, he delights in it. It makes him smile. It makes God say, oh, man, look, look my, my children are talking to me. Um, you love to hear your children come and talk to you. Um, you love to engage your children. And God, the same way, can hear all of his children across the entire earth, and he delights in our prayers. And so, um, the, verse 9, the way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he who loves one, uh, but he loves one who pursues righteousness. The way of the wicked, the path, the journey, the steps of the wicked are an abomination to God. Um, when God watches, remember his eyes are everywhere looking at everything, the evil and the bad. When God watches the evil and the wicked people walk, uh, walk out their lives and live out their lives, it's an abomination to him. Uh, God does not like it, but he loves the one who pursues righteousness. God is looking at the paths and the journeys of men both evil and both good, wise and foolish. And God says, this walk right here is an abomination to me. 
And when we start thinking about how important wisdom is, wisdom is not just for us. Get this nugget. Wisdom is not just for us. Wisdom is for God to evaluate us, to figure out, are you walking on the wise road or are you walking on the foolish road? So that's what wisdom really does, because it's not just us walking, but it's God watching us walk, God watching us live and God paying attention to our journey and seeing the progress or the regression of the walk that we're on. Um, uh, let me let me see if I want to skip down a little bit. Um, yeah, let me skip over to verse 13. A joyful heart makes a cheerful face. But when the heart is sad, the spirit is broken. A joyful heart makes a cheerful face. This is something that happens on the inside. When your heart is really joyful, people can tell your countenance on the outside. When there's something on the inside that is right with God in a joyful place, not a happy place, because happiness can change like that. Joyful is the condition that you're in regardless of the situation that you're in. Joyful is the condition that you're in in spite of the situation that you're in. Because you may not be in a good situation, um, but when you're joyful, that's the condition of your heart. And he said it brings about a cheerful face. You can smile at life in the good and the bad times. But when the heart is sad, the spirit is broken. Now, remember Proverbs 4.23 where it talks about guard your heart for out of it throw the, flow the issues of life. Notice here, a joyful heart makes a cheerful face, but when the heart is sad, the spirit is broken. You got to make sure uh, the condition of your heart, guard your heart. Is your heart joyful? Is your heart sad? What's going on? Because you don't want your spirit to be broken. And so in that Proverbs 4, 23, where it says, guard your heart for from it flow the issues of life. God is saying, you've got to always watch the condition of your internal heart. Because from the condition of the internal heart, it will show everything. It will show what you're talking about. It'll show what you are speaking about. It'll show the condition of your of your soul and your spirit at the time as you're walking through life. A continual disappointment in, 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 a, in a broken spirit. God doesn't want his people walking around with a broken spirit. God wants us to be joyful and to recognize that whatever we face, that God can deliver us. And so uh, verse 14 is a good verse. The mind of the intelligent seeks knowledge, but the mouth of fools feeds on folly. The mind of the intelligent. So intelligent people are thinking about knowledge. They're thinking about how do I continue to grow? Where do I continue to get insights? Last night, um, I had an opportunity to speak at a church. And I was speaking at this church and shared some wisdom, shared some insights. And one of the brothers came up to me afterwards. They, they had a Q&A session, a great Q&A session. One of the brothers came up to me afterwards and the brother uh, is actually a Jewish, uh, a Messianic Jew. In other words, he's trusted in Jesus Christ, but he's Jewish in origin. And he talked to me about his knowledge of Jewish culture and Jewish ways. And he said, hey, um, I'm friends with Pastor Dwayne. Pastor Dwayne knows me. But if you ever want to sit down and talk and have some lunch or sit down over time for me to discuss Jewish ways of the Bible with you, he said, man, I would love to, because there's some amazing things that from a Jewish perspective, me being raised a Jew and then believing in Jesus, um, you know, th th there's some amazing things that I could share with you that could give you some insights in the Jewish culture. Now, I've gone to Dallas Theological Seminary, got my master's degree, all that kind of stuff, but my teachers weren't Jewish. And I could have said, hey, they invited me to speak tonight and I got my master's degree. And I would have lost out on an opportunity for knowledge. So I said, hey, man, let's do it. Let's set up a time for us to get together, me, you, and, and Pastor Dwayne. I'd love to sit down with you. Why? Because when we're trying to grow, we're trying to seek knowledge. And if someone has something, that one man has something that could enhance what I now have received from him and now can teach to cross over and cross over and become closer to God, why would I reject that knowledge? We've got to be open. Here's the nugget. Never think that you've arrived. Never think that you've gotten too much. Never think that you've gotten so good. Because I don't know if that guy's got a seminary degree or not, but I know he's Jewish. I know that I'm not. And there's some things that he knows about the Jewish culture that I don't. But if I'm able to get those things from him and sit down and eat with that brother and share with him, and that allows me to enrich crossover, then I want to make sure that I get that. So let us never think that we've arrived. Let us remember the opportunities to grow and to mature in the faith so that we can continue to be a blessing any way we can. So he says, 
uh, the mind of the intelligent seeks knowledge, but the mouth of fools feeds on folly. Um, you know, what, the mouth that is speaking also feeds on foolishness. We don't want to be people who just exchange ignorance with each other. We don't, we, we don't want to be involved in that. We want to grow. We want to mature. And so let's dive down to verse 16. Let's dive down to verse 16. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil with it. Better is a little. Better that you not have much in the bank account. Better that you not have much on the table, but you have a fear of God. Then watch this. It says, then great treasure and turmoil with it. What if you have all the money in the world and no peace? Think about wealthy people, and I'm not going to go to Ecclesiastes now, that have so much but no peace, um, no, no, no joy, can't trust who they're talking to, always wondering if somebody's trying to get something from them. He said, better you have a little and an amazing relationship with the Lord than have a lot and have turmoil with it. Uh, that's verse 16. Uh, let's dive down to verse 18. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but the slow to anger calms the dispute. A hot-tempered man. He, here's a nugget. Don't be ready to go off. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife. Now, remember this. Go back to 15.1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Now, when we come back over here to 18, a hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but the slow to anger can calm a dispute. We ought to be slow to anger. James talks about it in James uh, chapter one. Remember, we, we, we keep going between these Proverbs and James. You'll keep hearing me mention because James, a lot of his New Testament wisdom comes from his Old Testament wisdom found in Proverbs. So he says, be slow to anger. A slow angered man can calm a dispute. In other words, when people are getting ready to get into an argument, a slow to anger person can come in and solve his own dispute and or can solve other disputes so that we don't have to stand around in a state of anger and hatred and bitterness and wrath and all this because someone slow tempered can slow down and or calm a dispute. Uh, let's dive down to verse 20. A wise son makes his father glad, makes the father glad, but a foolish man despises his mother. A wise son and or a foolish man, the father will be glad because he knows what I've taught my son, my son has embraced and my son exercises. That's what makes the father glad. What I've taught my son, he recognizes that I did it from love. He recognizes that I did it because I cared about him. He, I, I, I wanted him to have a road of success, a journey of success and walk with God. And so he says, it makes the father glad, a wise son. Uh, but a foolish man despises his mother. A foolish man uh, disrespects his mother, despises his mother's prayers. In Proverbs 31, the Bible talks about um, how this mother's been praying for this child while he was in the womb. A foolish man does things that breaks his mother's heart, um, that, that his mother cries over, weeps over. So we have to recognize that the life choices that we make on a road of wisdom or on a road of foolishness, it impacts others and how they, how their life is lived and what they're feeling as a result of what we did uh, with, with that time. Now, verse, dive down to verse 22. Verse 22 is a big verse. It goes back to don't try to do it yourself. Verse 22 says, without consultation, plans are frustrated, but with many counselors, they succeed. Without consultation, plans are frustrated. A lot of times, we're trying to navigate through life by ourselves. We don't want to, you know, we've been taught, and I'm talking about us. Um, we've been taught, man, don't be having nobody in your business. You don't want nobody in your business. Don't, don't tell nobody your business. But the Bible says without consultation, the plans are frustrated. In other words, that sometimes there are some big plans that you may have, but you may want to seek some counsel and some insight. You may want to think about some people who've already traveled down that road so they can tell you what's down the road, give you some guidance, give you some direction. And as a result of the direction that they give you, he says your plans can be established. Uh, but with many counselors, they succeed. So uh, get counsel in your life so that your plans can be successful. 
There may be something that you're trying to do, and right as you're trying to do it, God brings somebody across your path that shares some insight with you that you're like, oh, man, I didn't know that. As a result, you use that, and it ends up benefiting you and or blessing you. So without consultation, plans are frustrated. So make sure that you have a wisdom council around you of people that can assist you while you're trying to make life decisions. Um, now, mm, verse 23, I like it. A man has joy in an apt answer, and how delightful is a timely word. That is a great verse. How delightful is a timely word. Now, I want you to think about this. Have you ever been in some life situations and were wondering what to do and what was going on, and God had somebody come by with just a very timely word? And it, I mean, you knew that that word had to be from God because they, what you were meditating on, what you were thinking on, God sent somebody by with a timely word just like that. I can reflect back on a time when I was uh, doing some ministry and I was kind of having some questions about some things that were going on in the ministry and was a little, little frustrated. And um, God sent a brother way back in about 2001. And this brother called me from Washington, D.C., he was at the White House and at, at, and at the uh, Capitol building doing a father-son summit, and he was singing. Uh, he, was a, he, was, he was a songwriter, and he was singing for this father-son summit. And he's at the White House. He's at the Capitol. He says, God put me on your heart, and man, I called you to tell you this. And what he told me, he could not have—I was in Houston. He called me from D.C. I just got finished uh, singing at the Capitol. But the Lord put me on your heart, and I, t I called to tell you this. That answer at that time was so timely, and that's how amazing God is in wisdom. That God knows what you're thinking about, knows what's bothering you, knows what's hurting you, and God will send somebody by at the right time with a timely word. Proverbs 15, verse 23. Um, let's go down to uh, verse 26. The evil, the evil plans are an abomination to the Lord, but pleasant words are pure. Evil plans are an abomination to the Lord. For people who plot and scheme evil, God is disappointed. God is disgusted. Um, why would you take your time? Why would you spend your time plotting evil when you could plan good? Why would you think about how can I bring harm? How can I bring hurt? How can I participate in a conversation that's going to bring someone else down or tear someone else down? He says uh, God uh, is disappointed by that. Uh, but pleasant words are pure. That's verse 26. Then he talks about the fear of the uh, uh, verse, verse 27. He who profits illicitly troubles his own house, but he who hates bribes will live. Um, illicit profit financially versus depending on Jehovah Jireh. Uh, he says you bring your household um, in a bad position. When you're doing things financially inaccurately, it will catch up with you. And God says you're profiting illicitly. Um, Let's go down to verse 29. Oh, no, 28. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. Good verse, good nugget. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. How do I respond to this question? How do I respond to this situation? Let me not just pop off at the mouth. Let me think through. Let me be wise. Let me consider everything that's involved. Let me consider who's involved. And how will this answer be productive or destructive? And so the, the, the heart of the righteous ponders how to answer. Why? It's not that they're trying to say things the right way. It's they're concerned about what they're saying and how it's going to impact, build, and or construct. Because they want to make sure that they don't say anything destructive that hurts people and harms people down the road. Um, verse 29, the Lord is far from the wicked but he hears the prayers of the righteous. The Lord is far from the wicked, um, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. God, when it talks about geographical vicinity, God is distant from wicked people. He, he's not on their side. So when the wicked appear to be succeeding, like in Psalm 73, where David said, it looks like the wicked people are succeeding, God is far from that success. So it may look like success, but remember, God says he'll tear down the house of the wicked. It will not always stand because God is far from it. Um, but he'll establish the tent of the righteous. And so God um, uh, lets you know that his heart is far from the wicked, 
but he hears the prayers of the righteous. That God is, as we mentioned earlier, listening and waiting to hear from his people. Uh, let's dive all the way down uh, to verses 32 and 33 and we'll be done. He who neglects discipline despises himself. When a person does not respond to discipline and or instruction, it means that you're going to hurt yourself. Uh, not responding to discipline is the worst thing that you can do. Now, discipline is not that not in this case. Discipline is instruction. Discipline is someone teaching you. Dis discipline is someone directing you. Discipline is someone correcting you. It's instruction. And so he says, he who despises discipline uh, despises himself. Uh, you're, you're, you're not hurting instruction or wisdom. You're hurting yourself. When someone teaches you something and you don't have the ability to listen to what someone's teaching you, he says, you hurt yourself. The only person that you bring uh, problems to in situations like that is yourself because God sent somebody to, to teach you and to instruct you, but you wouldn't receive it. And so he says, you hurt yourself. But he who listens to reproof acquires understanding. He who listens to, to uh, reproof, he who listens to somebody who corrects him, you acquire understanding. You purchase understanding. Um, you, you value understanding. And then this last thing, the fear of the Lord is the instruction for wisdom. And before honor comes humility. The fear of the Lord is instruction for wisdom. But before honor comes humility. In order to really be a wise person, you're going to have to receive instruction. In order to receive instruction, you have to believe that somebody knows more than you. That God has put them on the path and on the journey a little bit further than you. And as God has done that, and you recognize that somebody knows a little bit more than you in an area or whatever it may be. But he says the only way you're going to receive that is with humility. The only way you're going to receive that is with humility. But remember what God said in the New Testament? Jesus said, God exalts the humble. God exalts the humble. And before honor comes humility. So as you and I become students of wisdom, as you and I become those people that will act upon wisdom, as we recognize, thank you for teaching me. Thank you for growing me. Thank you for maturing me. Thank you for showing me the path and the journey. Um, and I submit to that. Then God brings about honor and God brings about exaltation. But it all starts with humility. A wise person lives their life in humility, not in pride. Because God is opposed to the proud. He gives grace to the humble. God hates pride, but God loves humility. So to be a wise person... One of the main things that you're going to have to be is a person of humility, a person who has the ability to listen to others, not be wise in your own eyes and think that you have all the answers. Where the Lord works is the Lord works in humility. God exalts the humble. He's opposed to the proud. Um, he gives grace to the humble. He's opposed to the proud. So wisdom starts with a posture of the heart. It starts with a posture and a position of your heart and your mind being receptive that there's someone who's on the journey, who's traveled the road further, and they're turning around to tell me and to teach me how to navigate the path of life to make sure that I, write, that I make the right steps of the journey. People are telling you stuff to help you. They're not telling you things to hurt you if they're a wise person. A wise person will teach from both their failures and their successes so that you can walk the path of righteousness with the Lord and fear God. And so that's where it all starts. It starts with, am I, uh, do I have the humility to receive instruction and correction and direction for my benefit and the benefit of others so that I can walk in the ways of wisdom? And so that's Proverbs 15 for today. Uh, we'll uh, be back tomorrow at noon for Proverbs 16. But I'm going to give you a chance to ask some questions. Uh, if you have any questions, um, you know, I always ask y'all, hey, do y'all have anything you want to ask about the chapter? And we can dive in and dig and uh, and deal with it. Or if not, uh, I can go downstairs in the gym and shoot some basketball with my son. And so uh, he's down there shooting them up. I'm going to go down there and shoot some with him. So you tell me if y'all got any questions. Uh, I'll answer them. If not, I'm going to uh, see what's going on. So I'm going to look back and see if y'all have any questions on here. Um, so I'm just sliding down the screen, see if y'all got anything. Y'all got anything? All right. So it doesn't look like you have any questions. Uh, so I'm going to pray for us. 
Oh, no problem, y'all. Much love. Thank you all for joining in. Thank y'all for joining in. Uh, let me ask y'all this real quick. I got a question for y'all. I got a question for y'all. So what was your favorite verse in the chapter? What was your favorite verse in the chapter? I got a question for y'all real quick before I go and start shooting these jumpers. Um, what, what, what was your favorite verse in the chapter? It was that one that made me laugh earlier. Hold, hold up. Let me, I'm going to find mine and I'm going to give it to you. I didn't even speak about it. Um, y'all, y'all put your favorite verse in the chat, in, in the chat. Uh, oh, here it is. Here's mine. Proverbs 15, verse 30. Uh, bright eyes gladdens the heart. Bright eyes gladden the heart. Good news puts fat on the bones. Uh, uh, <laughs> Proverbs fifteen thirty. So I love I, I like that one because it said good news puts fat on the bones. So I guess I got some excuses for uh, the good news that I've received. Amen. Uh, because good news puts fat on the body. Um, Y'all like verse one. All right. Let's see. Let's see. People like verse one. All right. McGee like verse one. Stevenson like verse one. Lou Miller like 15, four. Somebody put me in my Proverbs 15, 30 for me. Uh, I got Proverbs 15, 18 by Sister Stevenson. Sure, they got Proverbs 15, four. I think Lou had 15, four. All right. We got some, some votes in here. Uh, John Davis got Proverbs 15, 22. Gwen got one and two. Let me, let me see what John got. Oh, oh, John, 1522, without consultation, plans are frustrated, but with many counselors, they succeed. Uh, Joaquin got 28, uh, 28, 28. The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked uh, pours out evil things. All right, all right. 31, the fear of the Lord is instruction for wisdom, and before honor comes humility. All right, well, good. I, I, I like it. I love it. And, um, well, I, I appreciate it. Let me pray for us, and then we'll be out of here. Uh, thank you all for staying on. Father, we thank you for an opportunity to be together in the word today. I, got, I just ask that you would keep people safe as we're traveling across the roads where family members may have already gone out early and have to come back. God, we just ask that you would be with them and keep everyone safe. Lord, uh, across this Arctic blast, not only in Texas and or in Houston, but across our nation, God, I pray uh, for the life of older people. I pray for our homeless population. God, and I, and I ask that the, that the church of the living God would not be satisfied with homelessness. I'm not talking about uh, the country or the or, or the civic government. I'm talking about the church. God, I pray that we would not be satisfied in days to come with homelessness and people being outside, God, and um, ask that we would work our hearts towards shelters to where men and women could come in. And, and I know that the general society has done those things, but God, the church, uh, the answer to the problem in the world is the church of the living God. And so, God, we thank you and we praise you and shape our hearts to where we act in wisdom and uh, that we show uh, a display the love of Christ in our hearts towards others. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Much love, y'all. Proverbs 15, 20. Uh, Proverbs 15, 2. I see you, Lynn Daniels. Uh, amen. Beverly, Proverbs 15, 24. Sister Henderson, Proverbs 15, 25. All right, all right, all right. Okay, amen, amen. Well, look here, y'all. Love you and hope to see y'all tomorrow. I think that we'll be home. Hey, Pastor Dwayne, uh, thank you for tuning in. And uh, Pastor Dwayne was where uh, his church, Pastor uh, Tallywood, was where I was last night with a great group of men, an amazing group of men. We had a great time last night. Um, so thank you, Pastor, uh, for tuning in. Brother Oscar, the eyes of the Lord are watching. Amen. Um, so much love, guys, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow for Proverbs 16, noonday. And uh, I'm really hoping and praying that the kids don't go to school tomorrow and we can get some fire logs and just sit down and chill out. Amen. So y'all pray with me on that. Oh, also pray for the Pittsburgh Steelers today. You, all you Houston Texans fans, pray for the Steelers uh, as we play up in Buffalo. Uh, we're going to need your prayers today because um, I don't think it's going to be a good day for us in Buffalo. So be praying for us. Amen. All right. God bless y'all. Uh, Brother McGee, pray for my team. All right. See y'all later.